Anyhow, Udi, somehow I don't see you. Uh, okay, can I ask the question? Sure. Uh, we are talking uh, in the last uh, few meetings. Ah, now it's happened. Now I see. <laughs> we are talking in the last few meetings about uh, being present in yes. the present time. And as long as uh, my thoughts are going, our past and our future are just stories in yes. this process of thinking. What happened in the past is story, what will happen in the future is unknown and unexpected. And uh, my question is uh, concerning the process of learning. Learning? Yes. Is yes. there is any meaning of learning when we are looking only on this present time? Yes, that totally. There is meaning in learning. That's what we are here for. <laughs> we came to this world to learn, to learn, to grow, to outgrow. Uh, of course, there is meaning in learning. <clears throat> Maybe we learn a lot of things that are not so important, but just of pra practical value. If we say the past is just a story, that doesn't mean we have to exclude the past as, and somehow wipe it out. We don't have to become a double rasa <laughs> all the time. The past is there as a valuable store of information. And for that, it's very useful. The problem is simply if we are emotionally attached to all those stories, then we are feeding our life force into stories that are simply stories. There are memories. They don't have any reality other than that, but being memories. And wasting the precious moment now, where life is really here, where everything is public. <laughs> but we can treat the past like a computer memory, full of valuable information and whatever is applicable, whatever is necessary for the present moment, we pick out and put it to use. So all the learning is perfectly useful. Simply don't get attached emotionally to the past, oh, what they did to me, oh, what I did to them, and, uh, and all the emotional stuff that makes us think and think and waste our energy. Just pick out whatever you have learned from the circumstances and from your own reactions and use it in the present where, it's a, where it makes sense to, for the present situation. But be here now. Let your attention be here now. Even when you think of the past, be now and think of the past. Even when you think of the future, we cannot completely not think of the future. Some, even a little thing, uh, you have to make at least a little plan. Now I have to go out of the house and uh, go to the garage and get my car and go over there uh, and go to work. So you are here now thinking of the future. You can make plans, but then you have to have the openness to be okay if they manifest, they are fine. If they manifest, they are fine. If they don't manifest, you are also fine. If you have that liberty, if you have that broad-heartedness, then you stay in the present, but you can use the information of the past and you can project in the future possibilities and still be totally now. Oh, now I don't hear you. Sometimes, oh, uh, yeah. between the, ex uh, the experiences that we are going through in this present time, that we learn something mm -hmm. from them, and we take them toward the future, that yes. can also be the source of uh, unsatisfaction or uh, disappointment, because we already create some hypothesis of what will be, our will be there. 
Yes. But this uh, disappointment, this dissatisfaction comes out of the mistaken identification with the personality that we think we are. And then we project the personality, we like to project a nice picture. And then if we react not according to our picture, then there is frustration and dissatisfaction. But if you are aware, okay, this person is just somehow the channel through which I connect on this level, on this reality, it's just the role that I'm playing. And if there we do things of which we after that think, ooh, they were not such happy decisions, they were not such happy reactions, then learn from it and let it go. It's past, it doesn't matter. You are richer for the experience. And if dissatisfaction comes, then you have a good look at yourself and see, okay, I'm identifying again. So then focus on the feeling of dissatisfaction. See what it is doing to you right now. Relax in that and let also that go. Okay. And if I can ask another question about the sure. connected to that is, uh, we use a lot uh, the sense of being authentic. Yes. Is it there is something like that? Yes, but it doesn't mean there is that real personality of you and the closer you are to that ideal image of your personality, the more you are authentic. <laughs> the more you are just conscious, consciously conscious, here, now, the more you are authentic, the more something beautiful flows out of your being, which is not your personality, which doesn't have really a definition. It's not a holy image of yourself, your being. It's simply your being. It's neither holy nor unholy. It, it simply is. And the more you are in consciously in touch with that, the more some beautiful creativity is flowing through you and manifesting outside and you can say the more you are authentic. It's not that you have your ideal image of your personality and the more you approach that, the more you are authentic. The personality is just a role you are playing. And sometimes you're playing like this, sometimes you're playing like that. But if you are consciously in touch with the source, with that which makes the experience possible, which, with that which makes the whole story possible, then you are really authentic. Because then something very beautiful flows through you into this story. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye, Yudi. <laughs> Anybody else would like to come in? Uti, can you, uh, are you still here? Uh, can you hear yes. me well? Yeah, can I you hear, hear you well and see it well. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anybody who right now wants to come in? Hello, Ah, okay. Yes. Hello. Hello. I would like to ask something. Yes, you are welcome. <laughs> Some people experience uh, the feeling of oneness yes. when they look at something in the manifestation, for example, a, a flower or a tree. Yes. How is it possible? Because oneness is supposed to be at the level of the self, of the, of the, of the absolute. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yes. And manifestation is an object. How can we be one with one object yeah. and 
because normally oneness is at the level of absolute, no? I, I well, don't understand. Uh, right. And you never will. And never will I. <laughs> and never will anybody really understand. <laughs> what is happening here is much too beautiful and mysterious that we could completely understand and say that's how it is. Oneness is an aspect of reality. In that oneness there is that multiplicity. And that multiplicity, everything is an expression of that same oneness. And so it is totally possible that people may sit in front of a tree, look at the tree, and then suddenly have the experience they are one with the tree. Because the one who is sitting there at the tree, both are expressions of the same oneness. Mm -hmm. And it can happen in your experience that you are experienced that. That doesn't mean uh, because of that, after that, the, you can call yourself specially enlightened or something. It's an experience. It's, but it helps if you have experiences like that to become aware that really there is nothing that is not an expression of that same divinity. There are people that, that claim that they have that they experience all the time. Wherever they look, they feel uh, the one who is looking and the look that they can experience both of them. I don't know. I don't, I'm not experiencing continuously that, but I do have experiences of experiencing what I perceive and myself as the expression of that same oneness. Knowing it's not, I mean, that doesn't mean that after that you understand that oneness. And oneness is the base. Oneness is the pure consciousness. Oneness is the pure love. Oneness is the pure force of life. Oneness is the divinity, already the first expression of that mystery which is prior to even oneness. <laughs> but if at all we want to have the idea of an absolute, that absolute is even prior to oneness. And the oneness and the multiplicity are both aspects of that. Mm. Okay. Don't try to grasp reality. Be it. Mm. Experience it. Live it. <laughs> Dive in it. Swim in it. Don't try to grasp it. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Namah Shivaya. No, Anybody else would like to come? Okay, then I will reply to a question from Rolly in Switzerland. Actually, Rolly is the son of my cousin. I don't know what this is in English, and leave you second degree or something. <laughs> and we have conducted quite many years. He's also on the way. But he told me he is digital shy, so he doesn't want to appear here. Now, his question is, what is it with that consciousness that is human, the consciousness that is animals or plants or minerals, what is the difference? Is there at all any difference? <laughs> Essentially, there is no difference. Essentially, everything is a manifestation of the same consciousness, of the same life, of the same love, of the same divinity. Essentially, all is the same. Yet, in manifestation, how it is manifesting, definitely, there are degrees. That does mean, doesn't mean that one 
form is more valuable, necessary. It's it's not hierarchic in that sense, but there is a different intensity to how consciousness is manifesting. Now, let's say a dog. That's an animal everybody knows quite well. And we are aware that dogs, they have a certain intelligence. They have certainly certain thoughts. They have no doubt strong emotions. But there is like a level of consciousness, a level of intelligence that is dog intelligence, dog consciousness. There are dogs that are more intelligent. There are dogs that are less intelligent, no doubt. But they are all within that span of that consciousness. The difference of the consciousness is the dog is still very instinctively conscious. A moment comes, is totally in the moment. What we try to do, what we try to achieve again, the dog cannot leave any different but be in the moment. When, when any neighbor dog comes in our compound and our dog gets angry. <laughs> There's strong emotion, strong reaction, chasing the other dogs out. Then the moment goes, the story is gone. It's not that the dog after that sits in a corner and starts to brood and thinks, oh, how can he dare to do such a thing? And I'm going to do something to him when he comes to the next time. The moment is gone, finished. But we have that consciousness that is reflective. We have the possibility not to be simply instinctively conscious, but to be conscious of being conscious. That is both a fantastic possibility, but it can be also a terrible curse. Because, as I said, the dog is not after that brooding about events. He sometimes dreams, obviously, when they sleep, they have their own dreams, but Basically, they're always new and fresh. Now, consciousness in the human form is self-reflective. We can be conscious of being conscious. And if we use that in the proper way, if we bring the attention back to our consciousness, to our being, to our love, to our force of life, just to that experience of intensity in the present, then that experience is unfolding and unfolding and there is absolutely no limit to that. It's simply staggering the potential how consciousness can unfold in the human form. But if that self-reflection is misused, that we project that idea about ourselves as me, as a personality, and think about that idea all the time, then our life can become such a painful story, like a dog can never suffer like humans can suffer, because we can brood about things and feel fall into black holes, fall into self-pity and think about me, 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 I, me, mine. That self-reflection of consciousness can be totally misused and then it's very, very painful to live. But we have every moment the possibility at, at least to attempt to let go of that and bring the attention back to the source, to that which makes the experience possible. That possibility a dog doesn't have. And of course, there are consciousnesses that uh, are then less and less conscious. A dog is still rather conscious, strongly conscious. 
that the plants are conscious, I have no doubt about it, and also matter is conscious. I don't know exactly how far, how much, I don't have <laughs> that direct insight in that, so I, I don't want to repeat what I heard from others, but I'm aware that everything is the manifestation of that same divinity, the same consciousness essentially is flowing through everything, and yet, in this world, in a human form, we have a tremendous possibility that the other forms usually don't have in this world. So, essentially the same, and yet as manifestation, there is a huge difference in the possibility, in the potential. I hope, Rolly, this has answered your question. Now, I'm open for new questions. Is there anybody who would like to come in? I see there are 47 people here. <laughs> Hi, Bernard. Okay. Can I ask a Hello. question? Yes, Hi, you're Bernard. welcome. It's Renate. How are you? Quite fine. Quite fine. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. I have a question about initiative. Yeah. It's about? Renate speaking. Initiative. Yeah. Initiative. I wonder, yeah. yeah. I wonder what should be our initiative in life. Especially since we say that we have to live back all the, the, the past experiences. And something should drive us toward the future, at least toward working out something. And I wonder what it is. There is you a, understand me? Yes. There is a deep longing in everybody. Usually people don't know where it is coming from. And then we have the tendency to try to fulfill that longing with all kinds of crazy things. Accumulate more wealth, have more fleshy experiences, you get more this, get more that, but somehow that longing is never satisfied. That longing is there because deep down we know that our true nature is pure divinity, it's blissful. And whenever we feel not like this, there's something somewhere we know, something is not quite right. And there is that longing to come home to our natural state. So if you want to have a real initiative and motivation, then have the motivation to, by all means, Come back to yourself. Live here, live now, live fully and relax. Apart from that, each one may have come with certain ideas already formed, even become before coming to this world, that there is certain types of experiences I want to experience. And so if you feel that externally you want to achieve something, then there is nothing wrong with that. Simply always keep it in the proper pro proportion that, okay, it playfully go about it. Put your energy in it playfully. And if it, if it works out, great, wonderful. And if it doesn't work out, so what? What is more important, whether you are achieving <coughs> your external goal, is that you learn to live fully every moment but somehow somehow or other we have to pass the time <laughs> somehow or other we have to leave somehow or other we have to behave so you can as well pick up 
certain ideas and you go towards them. But don't forget, it's not so important how close you come to that external goal. It's not so important how much you are achieving externally. It's much more important that you learn to live every step of the way consciously here now and then you're gaining really the most out of being human out of being alive thank but you it's, it's not that we all have to become eremites and live in caves <laughs> <laughs> live your life have your little uh, goals that you put there go about it playfully but don't make your well-being dependent whether everything always works out or not. Your well-being, your happiness comes out of yourself. Your sense of satisfaction comes out of yourself. And sometimes it works out that you are achieving something but that you try and often it doesn't work out. Don't let that face you so much. Know that the real happiness, the real sense of satisfaction and fulfillment comes out of yourself and then you can go for whatever you want to go thank you you're welcome anybody would like to come yes noor here hello hi one and how are you hello Nurji. Ah. I'm quite fine. <laughs> yeah, Noorji is uh, very hot here right now. <laughs> hot weather in Peru. Okay, yeah, so you were uh, discussing earlier the four, uh, what I call the four parts of me. Stula, which is my body, which is the yes. object. Yes. Then comes prana, which is my energy, like yes. the plants. Right. Then comes linga, which is like the dogs have it, the animals have it. Yeah. And then comes the fourth level, which is my Kama Manas, what we call in my language. It yeah. is me, mine, I, ego, blah, blah, blah. Right. Now, I understand those four guys, right? Now, there is a fifth person called Manas, which is what I'm trying to do for others and trying to be spiritual and this and that. Yeah. Now, as you know, I was not planning to be in Tiru. I come here for five, six days, and now I'm here for 75, 80 days. So I'm stuck here. So I'm trying to enjoy and make the best of it. And yeah. I'm meeting a lot of people who are on this so-called uh, spiritual path. You know? Yes. And it used to go <laughs> over my head 60, 70 days ago. Now I'm trying to understand them. Yeah. Now, I meet a lot of people who are saying, no, 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 no. We want to be alone and be meditating and you know I find them they don't have time to look outside they are looking so much inside from what I see and I'm not making a judgment or anything on them I'm just yeah. seeing that uh, like my neighbor downstairs she's doing vipassana for like 14 15 hours so I could be having a heart attack outside her room and she may not even know it I mean maybe I'm wrong but what I'm trying to say is they are too much inward looking is what I'm experiencing and most of them are vegetarians and they eat very little so when i look at them i feel that they are kadipel ones very thin and very weak but that's again i'm looking at it physically right, right. so right. not that i'm i'm trying to learn what the hell is going on around me in peru so i need your help on that yeah, so now yeah. i'm thinking that these guys are okay you know they're on some spiritual path uh, they are doing this and like this guy comes every at one o'clock to the downstairs place. I live in a commune, the Mantra Homes, and there's a common chicken. And he comes at one o'clock, this guy Amit, and he'll cook and he'll eat only once a day. So he's supposed yeah. to come up now to join you. So I'm noticing him. So I'm trying to figure out, uh, how, how, like I'm trying to see how I can fit in this spiritual path. So I'm doing a little bit, I get up, go to sleep at 10, and I get up at five and I do my Vipassana and I do my meditation. Then I go and look after my stula, which is my body. So I do a lot of yoga and exercise in the evening. Every evening I go and swim in the lake so yeah. that it keeps me fit. So that if I'm fit, if my lowest floor, my, my stula is good, everything else works well, according to my experience in my life. And uh, a lot of these guys who are on the spiritual hippies, as somebody told me the word, uh, they are not looking after their stula. I mean, they're like, like a half dead to me. 
you know, mm -hmm. but they are very strong, they tell me. So now my question is, I'm trying to figure and put all these pieces of the pie together. And like the story you said about the dog, I'm very much like that. I, I'm a little child and I forget if you did something wrong to me, I'll meet you next time on the road. I won't even know that you had done something wrong. That's my operating system from, yeah. my, from my life in the corporate world, you know, in Bombay and New York and everywhere else where I work. So now I'm trying to come to the point where I'm reading this book as to who are you and I'm trying to figure out to dismantle my ego. So now I've started to wash dishes, clean the room, do dharu pocha, cook my own food. You know, I never did this. And now that the, stock, the Shanti Cafe has opened, I went there and ordered food and I felt great because I didn't have to do it alone. <laughs> you know, eat at home and cook and clean because I'm used to that. So my question is this social distancing of what they are doing, at least in India, according to me and my friends in Bombay and Pune and Delhi and in the big cities, this social distancing is causing a lot of damage to their psychic fabric of the society, basically. You know, we, we are human beings. We are used to socializing. Like my son was in Washington, D.C. He says, screw this. He just went to Georgia and played golf and had a haircut. I mean, he's saying, you know, I'm not going to do this. So I'm also looking at how I can deal with this social distancing, which is causing a war within me because my nature is not to be anti-social. Yeah. So that's really where I am. So you could spend whatever time you want in whichever area you want. Yeah. Okay, you, these are two different topics. You ask now about at the end. Uh, after that, I come to the beginning of your question. But at the end, you were talking about the social distancing that was now imposed everywhere because of this virus. And of course, people who are not used to be alone and uh, to this social distancing, they will have a hard time. And yet, I think. For many people, it was not bad that forcibly they somehow had to spend more time with themselves and get more self-aware what at all is going on in their head all the time. So certainly it has not done much harm, but the, I mean, many people who are there mentally already not so stable may have had a hard time and needed help in this time. Now, before you were talking about Zadaks, and there is that social distancing that everyone is imposing on themselves. <laughs> and they are not doing that because they are afraid to get infected, but they are doing that because they have decided they want to spend their time and energy to go deeper into their own experience, in their own psyche, and not get distracted by socializing. Now, your way is not like this, I can understand, and it doesn't need to be like this, but please be patient with those who decide to go the way like this. If they decide that's what they need, then most probably that's the right way for them, that they need solitude. I mean, I have spent a lot of my time, uh, of my life in solitude, and it has done me a lot of good. That doesn't mean everybody has to do that, but it uh, means that those who decide that they need that, then leave them be. <laughs> Don't try to pull them out. If they want to come out and want to connect with you, then it's nice to connect with them. But otherwise, respect them that for the time being, even if you think it's not the best thing to do for them, maybe it's a necessary period that they spend a lot of time by themselves and not getting too much distracted with hanging out and talking and being social. <laughs> Now, you think because they are doing that, they will neglect their body. But uh, yes, I mean, many of them, they are still doing some yoga and something. And those who are really neglecting their body, if they have a very strong mind, it doesn't matter. But most of the time, <laughs> when they're really getting weak 
then they come out and start start to go and run after treatments. It is a bit exaggerated here, the tendency in this place to completely disregard the physical level. And because Ramana, he didn't care. Ramana Maharshi, but he was in such an intense connection with the self, with the divinity, it just didn't make a difference for him whether his body was fine or whether his body was not fine. He, he just was so totally absorbed and then, but still his body suffered. Uh, already in the middle of his age, he started to have manifestations that his body was having this shaking disease. But sometimes people asked him, but Bhagavan, how is it you are not so old and already all kinds of unhealthy manifestations are there? And he just jokingly replied, if you attach a big elephant into a smaller shed, then the shed sometimes suffers from that. <laughs> okay. But for him, that didn't matter. Because even when the body suffered, uh, he was still absorbed in that, that didn't disturb him. But then people think they can imitate that and they cannot. They, they say, I'm not the body, I'm not the body, until they get sick. And then they all forget about that and they have to go after a lot of treatment and are totally absorbed into that. So I think it's right as a, as a middle path, as a general approach that you keep your body reasonably healthy then it's a better instrument that you can spiritually unfold. Because not so many, there are not so many Ramana Maharshis walking around. Not so many beings have the total, real, total detachment that it just didn't matter. Most of the people are affected. When the body is weak, then the mind has the tendency also to become weak. So, don't get over obsessed about the body, don't get over enthusiastic about the body, but give it its proper attention. Like somebody who has a horse, who likes the horse, will treat the horse well and keep it healthy, then they can have a good ride together. <laughs> like that, treat your own body like this. Great, <laughs> got you. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank you. I understand. But leave people go their way. Uh, you need not try to imitate that. I mean, you are now over 70 years old and in whole, your whole life you have been a social being all the time. So you don't become a hermit now. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Difficult. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you can have your balance program that you have every day sometime by yourself, that you do your yoga, you do your meditation, and then uh, find people you can be together, but don't go after people who don't want to socialize. Find people who are also willing to come together, sit together, have some chat together, and a meal together. <laughs> well, that is increasing now. The cafes have opened, so I'm seeing a lot of people at Shanti Cafe and at uh, yeah, yeah. some other Satya Cafe. So it's opening up now. So and now plus I think they were they were all locked up for 75 days. So their beja has become fry also. They want yeah. to go. So now we are more at ease again. Yeah. Okay. So the other part of that question was uh, about the spiritual part, the yes. spiritual journey. Can you tell me what that what what is it that they are trying to do? The spiritual journey yes. or spiritual hippies. But <laughs> I don't know what word to call them. They are not, they are not from the normal mainstream of society. Obviously not, otherwise they wouldn't be hanging out here. And they are and most of them are and most of them are not from India, so they are from all sorts of countries. Right. I mean, each one is on their own path, and each one's understanding and motivation will be a bit different from one to another, but basically they are here and they are on that journey because they want to become more aware of what really is, of what they are, of the potential that is there. 
And if they think that's the way to go about it by withdrawing, then let them do it in that way, to focus more and more their undivided attention on simply being here, being now, being conscious. Of course, it's not for everybody that after that this is easy, and sometimes people get a little bit unbalanced doing that, but then sooner or later they come out and mingle again, and then this will balance out again. But for many, it may be just the right thing to do. So don't, don't look so much for them. Look at your own story and see that you are at ease, at peace, and then keep your Keep your balance program, keep your time for yourself and keep your social time. But even when you are social, try not to get completely lost in it, but even there, learn to be aware. What is it that makes the experience possible? What is it that is always there? Whether you are alone, whether you sit, you walk, you swim, you lie, whether you talk or keep silent, there is always that base, that ground that makes the whole experience possible. Learn to connect with that when you meditate but then bring that attitude as good as it's possible, as good as you can in your social life. And then you are also on the spiritual path also when you are hanging out in the cafe. <laughs> no, I'm enjoying uh, interacting with nature. So like when I go swimming, yeah. These kingfishers were 30 feet away and now the lake is drying up. So they are coming 10 feet away or, you know, they're coming closer, the birds. So yes. I'm trying to connect with them and I am, I can feel what they are feeling. now. You know, yeah. that has happened. Nice. Nice. So same thing with other birds and animals and with the yeah. heat in the morning, the snakes come out also. So I've seen them also. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think I understand what you're saying. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Wish you well, Lur. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else who would like to come in? Hello, Helen. <laughs> Hello, Vanna. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, um, as nobody's talking, I have a kind of superficial question. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> um, in my meditations the last few days, um, the, the, when I'm just feeling empty, um, yeah. then there is like a, immediately a, a pain in the neck yeah. um, between the top of the neck and, and where the skull starts. Yeah. And um, what happens then within the meditation is there is extreme imagery in the mind, like yeah, psychedelic yeah. imagery. Yeah. And, this, <laughs> and I'm waiting for this to pass. But it's been like three days now where it's just, yeah. The movie is going on. <laughs> yeah. and, and is it? It's really. Is it exactly the same as thoughts? You know, it's just a different part of the brain that's instead of thoughts in words, it's just pictures, pictures coming. Pictures. Yeah. yeah. And um, is I don't. I think I, my question was: Is that is that okay? <laughs> It feels a bit crazy to me at the moment, but um, I guess the answer is just watch it until it's until it's, until the movie's over. <laughs> but it's quite intense, um, yeah. and uh, what's happening is that it's very energized, so it's yeah. it must be releasing. Um, but I'm also uh, starting to get. I've had a couple of nosebleeds now. And I sneeze nice. a lot, and I yeah. sneeze one after the other, which is like a release. So, yeah. is, is your feeling this is all just a release, or should I stop? That's more question. Now, uh, that pain 
you are talking about? Is it coming in the beginning and then it goes, or is it there all the time and is intense? Um, it comes, and then it's it's kind of um, what what seems to happen is that I don't feel like I'm directing it with my mind, but what happens is that is I focus there and something. It's not like an explosion, but it's like as though, as though light. Um, yeah, I focus on it, but I don't even feel like I'm intentionally focusing. It's just the focusing on it happens, and then um, it, but like like so, light comes and it just dissipates. But then the yeah. dissipation seems to come out in this extreme imagery. Yeah. That makes sense. <clears throat> No, nothing wrong with that imagery. Don't get too completely lost in it. Don't yeah. get over interested in it. Mm -hmm. More, okay, let it come, let the movie go. <laughs> <laughs> go on, let it happen, but stay here and relax. Don't try to push it. That the, 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 somewhere you may push a bit that then the body starts to react and you get nosebleeds and a lot of sneezing all your sneezing may be a release of tensions that is there but well when it starts when the pain comes when the movie starts then let it happen but at the same time relax don't get fixed totally on that point where all this funny thing is happening but be aware of your whole physical manifestation and relax your body. Relax your legs, you relax your feet, you relax your shoulder and arms. And don't, if sometimes this leads to that the movie stops, don't, don't be sad uh, about losing that. It's, don't look at it as a, as a sign of spiritual progress. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. But, uh, I mean, all kinds of funny things may happen on the way, and there's nothing wrong with it. And if it gives you encouragement, then by all means, enjoy, enjoy the story, <laughs> enjoy the show. But don't get into it with the idea, oh, 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 now finally it's getting somewhere, and I have to somehow go through that into, into other stories, other stories, and bigger stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't lose your sense of being here now, but uh, don't push it away. Let it go. Let it go. The, the visions, the movies, whatever there is to come, the psychedelics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's not that it has to now settle into your mind that, ah, yes, this is now the opening and somehow in that direction there is the path and then we go ahead. The direction is now timeless, here, spaceless. <laughs> Not somewhere into a subtle psychedelic world. <laughs> yes. yes, I think this, I needed to hear this. Right, but uh, that, never mind. Don't think there is something wrong with it. Just let it happen. You can enjoy the show without thinking, oh, oh this, there it goes. Yes. Yeah, let it go, let it go. All kinds of funny things may happen on the way. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's and if it's enjoyable and inspiring to continue, then so much the better. But <laughs> but, but don't get attached to it and look at this as something very specially great. Yes. Okay, it's happening. Fine, wonderful. <laughs> It's not that we have to push such things away. It's not that we have to make ourselves dry, 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 and nothing should happen. We here, you know, we now dry. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it may feel a bit dry all by itself. And if there is a bit juice coming, then let it happen. <laughs> but 
<laughs> but at the same time, uh, it's always good to be aware. Okay, it's wonderful that the journey is a bit juicier when uh, when something happens. But at the same time, it's not. The reality is more in that direction. Okay, this is a facet of it, a manifestation of it, but stay with the ascent as good as you can, even when you enjoy. So you don't have to run after such things. You don't have to push such things away. Just let them happen as they go and let them go as they go. And then, nice, no problem. It's nice that it happens. Okay. Very nice. Thank you, Werner. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. You're welcome. Oh. You're welcome. Hmm. Anybody else would like? Okay. There was another question from Farouk. Baruch, 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 I hope. <laughs> Actually, it has to do with just what we discussed just right now, not exactly the same. He says that when he gets into his silence, usually it's quite, or often, it's quite empty, an empty silence. Not much is happening, it's just feels okay, silent, but empty. And sometimes there is a period or there are things, experiences where that silence is full of life. But that silence is very different. But then that goes again, and then again he goes into his meditation, comes to that silence, and that, that silence is again empty and more dead than alive. Now his question is also, what is this? And is that just my story? Is there something, <laughs> because there is something wrong with me? Or is that happening like this? And I can assure you, Baruch, there is nothing wrong with you. <laughs> it's just happening that way. You cannot by an act of will, shift over from that silence that you call is rather empty, maybe rather bad, to that silence which is full of light. You can, what you can do is bring your attention back to that silence as good as you can. But then the best way to open up that something profound can come in that silence. Something profound can happen is to relax. Be here, be now in that silence and relax. Relax as good as you can. But that's all as far as you can contribute. And then it will start to happen that the silence is becoming something else. Because usually when we work, when we meditate, when we struggle with our mind and then we get a certain amount of silence, it's a relatively silent mind. It's still the mind, it's a sattvic mind, what we call in India. Of course, the, the rajas, that is the active, the tamas is the, uh, the rather tired, dumb, <laughs> inactive way, but not alive. And then there is the sattvic that is quite alert, quite aware, but it's still a guna, it's still a quality. And so, by meditating, we make our mind subtle. And often it's becoming quite silent. But still, then one may feel, oh, but okay, big deal, silent, so what? <laughs> There's no, not much life in that silence, but the silent mind, it's more and more transparent and then sometimes you may get the experience, you may start to get glimpses that there is a silence which is not 
a silent mind. There is a silence that comes out of your being and it's totally alive, it's bubbling, it's beautiful, it's full of creativity and joy and bliss. <laughs> the silence is always there, but we are very rarely becoming aware that it is there. That potential is always there, but if you are going back again and again to the silence, the silent mind, then sometimes it just happens that more of the other is coming through. It can also come through when your mind is not silent, but the rule of thumb is that if you are again and again making your mind silent, then you are inviting it. You are, your mind is getting more transparent, that more of the other beauty can shine through. There's nothing wrong with anyone to whom this is happening, and then it goes back again to the old treadmill <laughs> that we have to work again, that we have to come back again. And are it that silence? That silence doesn't feel like very profound, but still, you are aware. But what you can do in that moment is not try to push through, not try to struggle, but be here now in that silence and relax. Let's go as good as you can. In that relaxing, that is the best way to invite that something else is happening. The difficulty for the mind is that we cannot do it and yet we can do something about it. <laughs> we can make ourselves available and meditating, doing your practices, coming back to your mental silence, to your sattvic state of mind, that is something we can do. And that is an invitation that something else is happening. That we can do. And usually it happens to those who persist. Sometimes there may be exceptions that uh, sometimes people get out of the blue without ever trying uh, rotator rotation into a new perspective, but usually it's happening to those who keep on making themselves available. And those experiences that come in between, accept them as a manifestation of grace. Okay, it's there, it's worth the trouble. And even if after that it's not happening, it's not because something is wrong in you. It's not because you made a mistake. It was not time that it simply could stay. But if you keep on, whenever it happens, whenever you connect with that, then be thankful about it. And don't try to figure out how did I do it? it <laughs> and after that, try to make, repeat the same steps that happened before that moment. I think that's how it was brought about. It, it was not brought about by any step. So when it is happening, be thankful about it. Thank you for that moment of grace. And get inspired, get encouraged to continue. And if it's not happening, then come back as good as you can to that silence, which is not so much alive, which doesn't feel <laughs> so bubbling, but still, it's a good state from where you can open up. So be silent in that state and relax, and relax, and relax, and open. And it will happen more and more that you feel that fullness, that life, that beauty, the creativity that will start to bubble up in that. But if it's not happening, don't be downhearted and don't think, oh, I did something wrong. You just go on and it will come more and more and eventually it simply may be there and you won't lose it. Anymore. I hope your question is answered for all. Is there anybody else who would like to talk?
I would like Werner to ask you according to what you have answered to Farouk. Yes. Does it mean uh, to keep this uh, centered part as a devotion? You asking? Uh, I'm asking the, if it's uh, a devotion, or uh, I expect that you want to continue. Is it a devotion, or <laughs> how you will describe the devotion? A person who is devoted to his way, God. to his way, right? Yes. Yeah. Of course, it's, de it's devotion. It may not necessarily a particularly devotional path, but to just keep on on your path to keep going even if there are periods when it seems dry when it seems not much is happening you can certainly call that devotion devotion for truth for god for yourself give devotion to what's really sincerely longing to be in a natural state where that beauty of existence is simply spontaneously manifesting. You can call it devotion, yes. Whether you are a particular, a typical devotee or not, doesn't matter. It's still devotion. <laughs> okay, thank you. You are welcome. Yes, we are still 48 people here. Nobody has a question? Anything they want to discuss of all these 48 people? <laughs> Fene? Fene? Oh, yes, hello. I, I, I also have a second question. <laughs> You're welcome. Keeping, it, <laughs> keeping with what uh, Udi asked and Farouk before, I wonder what's the difference between devotion and uh, being very an attachment. Devotion and attachment, yes. Yeah. Can't we look at devotion as another way of calling it attachment? It, I mean, it's always a question how we are using words. But let's make, just to use it in this context, let's make a difference between attachment and devotion. And use the word attachment to describe that which is not very advisable and devotion that which is very helpful. Exactly, that's why I need to understand the difference. <laughs> right. <laughs> attachment is something I'm producing as a person because I'm having the experience or the, that something gives, gives me a kick. So I'm being attached to it and I want to repeat that experience and I want to repeat that experience and want to get new, new kicks. Hoping that in this way, if I'm repeating my kicks, Often enough, then my quality, life quality, is getting up a bit. <laughs> Usually, uh, it doesn't work very well, because if what we are attached to is working out, then we are happy, but so many times it's not working out, and it's not functioning, and then we are unhappy. So most of the time, attachment doesn't help us to improve our life quality, but rather creates a lot of trouble. Because we want something, thinking that my well-being, my happiness is dependent, that I have this, that I have that. And then when it's not there, then I'm unhappy. Now devotion is something different. Devotion comes, the call from yourself, the call from your divine nature, 
that makes you clear that makes you clear that you need not suffer you need not be in that state of dejection you can be blissful and happy and bubbling with life and beauty <laughs> this is your right this is your birthright this is your true nature this is the call from your natural being and then the devotion that the person develops that i if i'm still identifying with the person is more that we are listening to the call of the self and open the heart and then the devotion becomes already blissful already just to be devoted gives us already you're getting a glimpse of the sense of satisfaction that you are getting out of yourself i can no, of course it is possible that we are polluting that devotion very much with our ego and, and make it into an ego trip but if the real devotion is there then gradually the ego part will wear out <laughs> i can tell you from my own story when i came to ava I had already been doing so much things before. And at that time, I really was mad. I was mad with the thought, I want enlightenment. <laughs> I want realization. And that devotion to that was true. But at the same time, me, I, I uh, very much call it that devotion. That I had my me Werner personal agenda <laughs> that I want something had my own imagination what that something should be from all that I have heard from all that I have read and being most of the time very pissed that nothing like this was happening <laughs> <laughs> now Alma saw that's how I'm functioning so she encouraged to continue like that because there was also that true devotion there, that real longing from getting rid of all that. She tried to give me sometimes pointers and said, but when I was complaining how I'm feeling, I can't live anymore. But there were periods when I said, I can't live anymore. I can't continue like this. Oh, I don't want to live anymore in this world. <laughs> and she, she sometimes tried to give me a bit pointers and said, but but when I used to call to God, there was so much bliss in it. <laughs> but instead of listening and seeing what she was pointing at, I said, yeah, my experience is the, is the opposite. I call, I call, I feel all miserable. The, way, the reason why I felt miserable about it was that it was not pure devotion. There was that attachment to my ideas what should happen and what should not happen and being in me i person Werner, being very unhappy about it that uh, it's not happening but since that true devotion was also there it gradually this had to had to wear out and uh, gradually i developed a little bit something like patience <laughs> uh, and acceptance So often the two are mixing a bit together, the attachment and the devotion. But then if you are aware of that, then you can consciously focus on the devotion part. Uh, part. Whether you are devoted towards God, whether the, you are just devoted totally abstract to a truth or fulfillment or whether you are devoted to yourself, it's all the same. But if that devotion, if that devotion for reality is sincere, then more and more this will manifest. And you can discern, oh, there I bring my own mind into it, that there I bring my own agenda into it, and want to uh, order god or reality what should happen and what should not happen 
And uh, if you become aware of that and you are capable of letting that go, you can let go that part. <laughs> but that devotion is really that which keeps you going. The devotion mm -hmm. to truth is the call from reality. It's the, it's the call to come home. By all means, don't think that devotion is wrong or attachment. The attachment we are creating in the mind when we superimpose on that devotion all our concepts, what should and should not happen, how our experience should be, how our, our enlightenment should be, or whatever, then that devotion is tainted. But still, if the devotion is there, the other part will slowly go. Max, Max, Maxim, uh, please mute your microphone, you're interfering. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're, you're back on the picture. <laughs> <clears throat> so it's not the same, they can sometimes mingle and then it's not always so easy to distinguish but if you are true to yourself if you are honest with yourself you can make the difference and then you can put your attention on the true devotion and let the attachment and the Mimi who wants to direct the show gradually fade out thank you you're welcome Maxim, didn't you wa did you want to say something because you came in without wanting? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see that the microphone was uh, on. Now your microphone is on, but your camera is off. Do you want to come in with the camera? Ah, hello, hello Maxim. Hello. <laughs> are, are you back in near Moscow in your home? Uh, no, uh, no, I'm uh, at uh, home, my friend's home. Uh -huh, I see, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I turn on. Uh, turn off. You, uh, you didn't want to talk anything. Uh, no, no, sorry, I uh, uh, accidentally turn on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, it's nice to see you. Uh, <laughs> are you home, Maxi? Are you home? Are you home? Anybody would like to talk? Okay, there is a second question from Holly from Switzerland. Oh, okay, we come back to Rolly's question after. Hello, Visha. I can see you, I cannot hear you. Hello? Now I hear some sounds, but I don't make out what you're saying. Uh, just, just give me a second. Ah, now I hear you. <laughs> yes, just, yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Hello, hello, you Fine. Yes. Uh, uh, Your picture some, is frozen, but some, I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, some technical problem I get right now. Just Anyhow, give me a second. I can hear uh, you. That's good enough. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, then I uh, ask a question, but maybe it's not a real question because <laughs> I mind, right? don't it's know how to question. formulate it. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, I come back in Russia and I live near yeah. Vipassana Center. 
Yes. Yeah, and and um, I have um, I am on uh, alone now in at my home. I cannot go out, but um, I have neighbors neighbors of Vipassana, and I know everything what is happening there, and there's kind of conflict in between teacher and other servers and oh. difficulty to find the balance between the discipline and democracy so and some people want to complain and teacher because teacher kick out of one person from the vipassana center and this person was serving a lot and yeah and i'm now kind of a difficult emotional situation of course uh, discipline is important and of course the uh, people who serve a lot uh, also have a right to say something and correct how things going on so that's the point what i want to share to you mm -hmm. <clears throat> i know that you used to be very closely connection connected to that center are you still sort of an official part of that center and that sangha uh, i am participate and serve serve some time but i'm not uh, really full time serving in the personal center yeah yeah well i mean i cannot now sitting in india somehow <laughs> dictate <laughs> <laughs> what should happen in your Vipassana center and what the teacher should or should not do. But for yourself, you can take a stock. Oh, oh now you're moving also. I see your picture of them. <laughs> but for yourself, you can look into yourself and make sure for yourself does it feel right to connect? And if you connect, you can voice your ideas. But if there is uh, a teacher who is doing it differently, then you have can question yourself, can I still connect in spite of that? And if you can connect, then accept that uh, it is going the way it is going. And if you feel things are happening and it, I somehow cannot accept. It's somehow disturbing me too much. Then you have the right to disconnect. But you can also accept uh, to a certain amount, okay, certain aspects I don't like so much, but in spite of that, basically I think it's a good thing that it's happening. It gives people the possibility to go and sit and meditate. So when you are there, and if you feel like you can continue connecting with it, surfing with it, meditating in it, even if you feel certain things are not so optimal, maybe you can privately try to talk to the teacher in charge and give him your ideas. But then you have to accept that if he is the teacher, okay, democracy is good, but then in such a spiritual organization, maybe sometimes the teacher will have to give the directions. And then those who like it stay, and those who don't like it don't stay. <laughs> yeah, I think I should talk personally, but I cannot go out right now 14 days in quarantine. Oh. So that, yeah, that's yeah, why yeah. I'm kind of thinking myself <laughs> how to behave. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And then wait. Uh, either you can talk to the teacher like this, somehow on WhatsApp or on phone. <laughs> Maybe you can look into each other's eyes on WhatsApp. <laughs> yeah, no. But you can also think, okay, it's now right now not my duty to do something because i just arrived and i'm forced to stay in quarantine and then you wait your time out until you can go there personally and connect 
and then see how it goes. Yeah. If, yeah. if you think something went really wrong, then better go and talk to the person in charge, in authority. <laughs> Happily, peacefully, if possible. <laughs> and just uh, tell what you think about and then see whether the two of you can find uh, something that can come together. And if you feel it's not possible, the way it's developing, it's going too much against your grain, then you have the right to say, okay, then it's not my place anymore. Yeah, I will think about, thank you, Werner, for clarifying. You're welcome. Yeah, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, you are also near Moscow? Yeah, near Moscow, about 100 kilometers from Moscow. 100 kilometers, but out in nature. Yeah, wonderful weather now. <laughs> we enjoy after India, <laughs> cool weather. <laughs> cool weather, yeah. Here it's not exactly cool right now. <laughs> okay, wish you well. Okay. Hello, Werner. Hello. Hello. <laughs> this is um, um, Vivian from Vivian? Switzerland. Vivian. Yes. Hi, Vivian. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, if my understanding is correct about um, being like healing and um, well, I, I see it that when I'm open to the present moment that automatically I create my whole environment so that everything that needs to be here in the moment will be an opportunity for me to release maybe things that were stored in the deep unconscious so that these things automatically free themselves and if i'm present in the moment and let it kind of flow through then this is how i actually get free of um, blockages or like stored emotional things and i had a discussion with the friend who is Buddhist and he would tell me that I should actually change kind of the patterns that I'm in and I don't know if I'm if I agree with that because if I feel that I need to change something at the, in the situation then I wouldn't fully accept it when it is here and I do feel when I look back that maybe the same themes come, but it's, it's lesser and lesser. And I've learned with every time I, I kind of go through. So I rather don't like to think of me needing to set intentions or to work on something, but to just be open and kind of trust that the moment will be what I need to learn. But I, yeah, I don't know if I missed something. No, uh, it, I understood perfectly what you are talking about. What your Buddhist friend said, uh, one can do that. Uh, one starts to recognize bad tendencies in one's own character and tries to replace it by good tendencies. Mm. But uh, the more important thing is that we learn to detach from them. It, and then this getting better and better, trying to produce better and better tendencies is again also a trip, a personal trip. It's not a question that we are getting holier and holier and holier and holier. <laughs> it's, it's a question of becoming natural, at ease, at peace. So if you don't feel attracted to uh, looking at your patterns and then exchanging them with more noble patterns, then you need not go into that thing at all. You can very well continue like you're doing. Just become aware of those patterns that invariably, you know, 
if I'm going down that alley, it's creating pain. It's creating suffering for myself and for those around, and I don't want them anymore. Mm. It doesn't mean you have to work on it to exchange them, but rather see them. Mm. And each time it's popping up, then you may make the intent that you let it go, that you don't want to go into that in that way anymore. Then you may think, okay, it's fine. And then the situation comes and puff, there we go again. Then never mind. Don't waste your time beating yourself up, scolding yourself and say, oh, I'm no good. And after all these years. And blah, blah, blah. <laughs> 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 but okay, just accept, uh oh, it's still there. Got me mm -hmm. again. So what? It's already passed when you become aware. Okay, there is more work to do and you can renew that intent that you want to let it go. And if you work on it like this, if you relax it rather than try to bend it around, then gradually mm -hmm. it will disappear. But you, you can also accept the deep ingrained conditionings, deep ingrained patterns, even if we decide to let them go, they may not go from one day to another. Mm -hmm. But being aware that they are happening and not liking very much that they are happening already is doing the job, that they are getting weaker. Mm -hmm. patterns, they are getting stronger and stronger. They have become so strong because most of the time they were not aware that we always repeat, <laughs> repeating the same thing over and over and over. And as mm -hmm. long as we are totally getting into it and feeding our life force into it, then it becomes stronger and stronger. But when you see it and you don't want to connect, then you don't feed the life force. If you fight them, you also feed the life force into it. And then it's becoming a heavy struggle, fighting, fighting, fighting. Rather, watch it. Okay, got me again, so what? It's past, I want to be free of it. More, it's more a question of learning to relax it to see it and relax it and letting go. And gradually then the power of old habits is lessening. And eventually it's gone. And it, mm -hmm. It's still there as a memory, but when it's coming, then you're, uh, you see it. And you have the freedom to decide, do I want to react now like this or do I not want to react like this? Do I want mm -hmm. to go down in that alley again playfully, not being attached or no, I don't want. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you need not uh, exchange your pattern if you don't want to. But if somebody feels like doing so, that's a way to go about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can uh, by exchanging old patterns with new patterns, in that way, loosening from the old attachment and then you can let go of both of them. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You are welcome. <laughs> you are in Zurich, aren't you? Yes. You live in Zurich? Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. But yeah. I go to Assisi next week. You go to? Assisi in Italy. Oh, I see, see, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yes, the nice. borders yeah. open next week and then oh, yeah. I can yeah. go to meditate. Yeah. And uh, can you, can foreigners come into Switzerland? No, not yet. Not yet, it's still closed. Yes, it, <laughs> Italy made it uh, on, on their own. They decided to open the borders, but without agreement with Switzerland. But then, but then you cannot come back to Switzerland until the Swiss open the border again. No, I can because I'm a Swiss citizen, but ah. they might tell me that I have Current to go to time. quarantine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I see. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all the best. Thank you so much, Vernon. Cool. Thank you. You are welcome. Have a good time. Hmm. Actually, I think talking one and a half hour is maybe enough. We don't have to talk two hours. Usually after one and a half hour talking, then I invite people to sit quietly and meditate, but I'm not doing this online. 
So if there is not now suddenly an urgent question popping up in anyone, then I would say, okay, let's stop for today and then we'll do it again next Saturday at the same time. I'm going to stop the recording.